Our lectionary passage this morning comes from the prophecy of Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, verses 1 and then 4 through 7. Listen, hear, and receive God's word. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat what they produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, I would venture to guess that most of us have never given um, much, if any, thought to what it's like to live in a foreign land, whether by choice or by force. Most of us are relatively comfortable living in this country, although our lived experiences may be different based on our ethnicity, gender, gender identity, race, social, or economic status. Being born in this country affords many of us, or most of us, a sense of belonging, a sense of being home, a sense of relative acceptance. We are not the other here. Professor of Social Ethics and Latinx Studies, Miguel de la Torre writes, most Hispanics, regardless of where they are or how they or their ancestor found, ancestors found themselves in the United States, live on the borders. Borders that separate privilege from disenfranchisement, power from marginalization, and whiteness from colored. End of quote. I quoted Dr. De La, de La, de La Torre to bring to our attention the fact that September 15th to October 15th is Hispanic Heritage Month, the month that we proudly set aside to celebrate the histories, cultures, and contributions of American citizens whose ancestors came from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. I found that information proudly proclaimed on a government website. Now don't get me wrong, I wholeheartedly support celebrating the heritage of all people living in this country. However, I find it patronizing to presume that a month, 28 days to 31 days, is enough time to celebrate the heritage, contributions, blood, sweat, tears, and lives that people of color have extended and expended to make this country one of the most prosperous in the world. All while too many people of black and brown skin do not benefit from that same prosperity. God's people found themselves residing in a foreign land, taken into captivity by the Babylonians. Womanist theologian and professor of Hebrew, Will Gaffney states, for all intents and purposes, it was the end of the world for God's people. At least that is what it must have felt like. It was the end of life as it was known in Jerusalem and in Judah. It was to these terrified and shell-shocked exiles the prophet Jeremiah sent a pastoral letter. Gaffney continues, Jeremiah was called to serve amid the devastation and destruction of everything that he knew. And in his moment in the spotlight, when he could have spoken as the second coming of Moses, proclaiming liberation from Babylon and a second exodus to the promised land, Jeremiah had some bad news. The people were not going anywhere. End of quote. I'm not implying that we are in a season of exile or captivity, although it may, may seem that way for some. I acknowledge that some of you may feel adrift, lost, or perplexed. Some of you may feel that ELPC as you have known it has changed forever and that nothing will ever be the same. And I concur that you are absolutely right. 
God is calling us to discern what God is doing in this season. This is a time to be still and willing to go where God is leading. This is a time to embrace leadership in the interim time, before the interim, and in the interim time. This is a time for us to move on from the familiar and the comfortable and to be stretched and challenged and uncomfortable as we continue to be the church, the body of Christ, the people of God, walking with our community near and far, standing with the disenfranchised, the marginalized, and the oppressed, and feeding the hungry, supporting the homeless, clothing the naked, and standing in the gap for those who have fallen through the cracks. Although Jeremiah looms large in biblical history, in his day he was not that significant. You see, he was born in the land of Benjamin, and Jeremiah was nearly put to death for a sermon he gave in the temple. I have that fear on a regular basis. <laughs> he was put into stocks as a living illustration of the Israelites' bondage, and he dispatched his letter to the exiles in Babylon from Jerusalem. Because you see, Jeremiah was left behind during the Babylonian invasion, as he was deemed as not important enough to be deported. Jeremiah found himself standing alone and in competition with prophets who had not received a word from God and nonetheless prophesied in an attempt to make the diaspora feel better about their current situation. In particular, the prophet Hananiah, son of Azur from Gibeon, took it upon himself to speak in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priest and all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon, and within two years I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house, which King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon took away from this place and carried to Babylon. Hananiah continues, speaking for God, I will also bring back to this place King Jeconiah, son of Jehoiakim, of Judah and all the exiles from Judah who went to Babylon, says the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. I'm sure that Hananiah had heard that the people were lamenting and crying out in the words of the psalmist read earlier. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung our harps, for there our captors asked for songs and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion, but how could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Hananiah presumed that he could encourage the exiles by declaring that their time in captivity would not be long. Ah, but Hananiah had not heard from the God of Israel, and he was simply telling the people what they wanted to hear, attempting to placate them. Hananiah was not telling the truth. I believe that it was Timothy who wrote in the time that is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers who suit their own desires. As God's chosen prophet Jeremiah dispatched these words, the truth, to the people living in exile. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, bid, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat what they produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. And Jeremiah continues speaking for God, for thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. One commentator writes, Israel's punishment is real. Seventy years is a full lifetime and those who went into exile will not return home. But in the midst of exile, there is the possibility of life. 
even as Jeremiah claimed that in the midst of foreign dominion, there was the possibility of survival. The commentator continues, what is happening is fully the Lord's doing and is quite intentional, purposed ahead of time. The destruction of Jerusalem and Judah and the deportation and exile of his citizens. And it is true also of their deliverance, the return from exile after 70 years. Now, lest we get it twisted, Jeremiah did not tell the exiles to worship other gods or to take on the pagan customs and lifestyles of their captors. Quite the contrary. Jeremiah said that in the meantime, the Israelites were to settle in, establish themselves in that place to remain faithful and obedient to their God and to build, plant, and eat to marry, bear children, to multiply, to seek the welfare of the city, and to pray to the Lord for the welfare of that city in which they were exiled. For it was there that they would find their welfare. Now Jesus understood the condition of people living in exile, for he was a stranger in a strange land. Jesus came to earth and lived among us, emptied himself and obediently took on the form of a servant, declaring that foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus was the ultimate exile, and yet he was about his father's business in his exilic state. You see, Jesus healed the sick and restored sight to the physically and the metaphorically blind. He clothed the naked and released the imprisoned. He empowered the oppressed and he challenged social and religious structures and institutions. And oh yeah, Jesus fed the hungry. It really doesn't matter what any of us think about where we are in this season. This is fully God's doing. It is intentional and purposeful. And it can be transformative and generative if we faithfully hunker down and continue to do the Lord's work. Paul dispatched a letter to the Christians in Philippi encouraging them to forget about what lies behind and strain forward to what lies ahead. Hebrew scholar and commentator Terence Fredham writes, the creative work of God among the exiles is an important time of preparation for God's eventual work of redemption. When God's redemptive work does occur, it will not occur in a vacuum, but in a context that has experienced the effective work of the creator God. Only in and through the growth of God's people will God have anyone to redeem. End of quote. Beloved, we will not grow, nor will we be ready to receive what God is and will do if we continue to look back and pine after what was. So what are we to do while we are in this liminal space, this time of already and not yet, this in-between time? Like the people of Israel, we are to settle in, to continue to live faithfully and be steadfast. We are to continue to serve. Let me say that again. Continue to serve in this koinonia and pray. And pray. And pray. trusting that God is faithful, believing that God loves us and God is with us, and acknowledging that God's plan is to give us a future with hope. So in the meantime, we shall sing songs of Zion. In the meantime, we shall praise the God of our salvation and in the meantime, we shall pray for the welfare of all, and most especially the stranger, the immigrant, and the sojourners in our midst. 
In the meantime, we shall be about God's business of caring for creation. And in the meantime, we shall be examples of Jesus walking with and accompanying people who are marginalized, disenfranchised, discriminated against, oppressed, and othered. And in the meantime, we shall challenge systems and institutions. That's what we're called to do in the meantime. May it be so. Amen.